Bretton Woods 2.0, the IMF's plan for total control. As you can imagine, this revolves around central banks, digital currency, and potentially a global digital currency from the IMF using SDRs. I'm going to explain this to you in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, it starts with central planning cowbell. <laughs> That's right. It's just like the Saturday Night Live skit with Christopher Walken. More cowbell. <laughs> These people at the IMF, the World Economic Forum, and politicians, they see the world the exact same way. Whenever there's a problem, the cure is always more central planning, just like the cure for every single part of that song in the Saturday Night Live skit was more cowbell. Got a problem with poverty? No problem. More central planning. We've got a problem with clean air? Not a problem. More central planning. We've got riots and looting. GDP is down 20% because of the Cervasa sickness. Unemployment up over 10%. No problem. All we need is more central planning. Their Bretton Woods 2.0 plan has three main objectives. Editor, let's go right to the IMF's website so the viewers can see I'm not making this stuff up. And first, they want to micromanage the economies using central bank digital currencies. They want equal outcomes. They don't ever talk about equal opportunity. That should be the focus. They want more inclusion. They want a fairer economy. They want everyone to cross the finish line at the same time. If we have a society that focuses on fairer outcomes instead of opportunities, as Milton Friedman has shown us, you're going to have big, big problems. That's why I always say these initiatives from the IMF or the World Economic Forum, from these global elite, always have these overtones of Marxism. Their third objective, green energy, and I don't want to go down that path in this video. That's a whole another rabbit hole. But we need to understand that electricity is a less dense energy source than petroleum. So it's going to be very difficult for us to transition to that without decreasing our standard of living. And I understand that wind and solar is becoming more viable, but how many petroleum products are used to create that one solar panel you have on your roof in California. I'm all for clean air, but it's a cost-benefit analysis. There are no solutions. There are only trade-offs, as Thomas Sowell has taught us many, many times. But let's stay focused on the monetary component of Bretton Woods 2.0. The IMF's own fiat currency is the SDR, special drawing right. The genesis for the SDR goes all the way back to 1944 in the original Bretton Woods. Keynes saw Triffin's paradox coming in the future. He said, this isn't going to work. He was very hesitant about the dollar being the world reserve currency. He thought it should be something outside of any one country. And if you're not familiar with what Triffin's Paradox is, we'll put a link to some of the videos I've done recently in the description below. But basically, you got to think about it this way. The United States is about 30% of global GDP, but dollars are used in about 70% of the transactions. So in order to create all those dollars outside the United States, theoretically, we have to run a trade deficit year after year after year. We have to import all of these goods and export those green pieces of paper so the global economy can run at maximum efficiency. The problem is it hollows out our manufacturing base. Therefore, we end up not producing anything of our own and all the foreigners own our assets because they take those green pieces of paper and they don't burn them. They go in and they buy treasuries, they buy real estates, they buy stocks. So again, that's a completely separate video, but Keynes saw this problem all the way back in 1944. You got to give him credit for that. As a result, when the IMF and the World Bank was created, and they were created as a result of Bretton Woods, 
The SDR became their fiat currency based on the ideas of Bancor and Keynes himself. To better understand SDRs, let's go right to the IMF's website. The SDR was created by the IMF in 1969. Currently, the amount of SDR stands at just over 204 billion. Its value is based on a basket of four key international currencies, the US dollar, Japanese yen, British pound, and the euro. There are no notes or coins denominated in SDRs, but the SDR does play a role as an interest-bearing international reserve asset. The IMF allocates SDRs to its members in proportion to their standing in the organization, which is largely based on their share of the global economy. The allocation of SDRs boosts member countries' official reserves. While SDRs cannot be used to purchase goods and services directly, countries can exchange them amongst themselves. Once the SDRs have been added to a member country's official reserves, a country can exchange its SDRs for hard currencies such as the US dollar, euro, yen or pound through voluntary trading arrangements with other IMF member countries. If a member purchases SDRs and its holdings rise above its allocation, it earns interest on the excess. Conversely, if it sells SDRs and holds fewer SDRs than allocated, it pays interest on the shortfall. So the way this would work is the IMF would be in control of everything. Shocker. <laughs> I know, you can't believe it. Wow, it's amazing how that works. Going back to cowbell, we just need more central planning. If the IMF is in charge of everything, solves all of our problems. But there's no free lunch. The IMF would give the central banks of these different countries SDRs as this backup reserve asset in exchange for data and control. The central banks would have their own central bank digital currency. More on that in just a moment. And that would allow them to get around the banking system and lend directly into the private sector, more specifically, these corporations. In their mind, they think this is our main problem because the banks themselves are required to create the majority of the money supply unless the governments are just going into more and more debt through deficit spending and the central banks monetizing their debt. In other words, creating more funny money to buy the bonds directly from the government or in this shell game process we have in the United States with the primary dealer banks. And if this sounds familiar, it should. It's very similar to the swap lines the Fed came out with during the Cerveza sickness going back to March. But those didn't work either because they stopped at the banking system. None of these banks wanted to lend to the corporations that had this dollar denominated debt, but all their cash flows coming in in another currency. That was a big problem. Why didn't the banks want to lend to these corporations? Because they knew they didn't have a liquidity problem. They had a solvency problem, way different than 2008. They don't have enough cash flow coming in to service their existing debt, let alone more debt thrown on them by the banking system itself. That's one of the main reasons why the euro dollar system is broken, something that my good buddy Jeff Snyder has been talking to us about for years now, quite frankly, till he's blue in the face and no one other than us listens to him. Those central bankers should tune into his podcast, Making Sense with another good buddy of mine, Emil Kalinowski. But back on topic, this is the problem the IMF sees. There's no way to get this liquidity, these excess dollars or SDRs or currency, whatever you want to call it, from the central banks to the corporations in the private sector to create inflation, to plug any holes for UBI stimulus, whatever you want to call it. And the way the central planners think we can get around the problem of having to rely on the commercial banking system inside and outside the United States, whether it's country XYZ, ABC, one, two, three, is to have the central banks themselves have their own digital currency. Editor, let's cut right to a clip 
of Jerome Powell discussing central bank digital currencies with the IMF. We have an obligation to stay on the forefront of policy and technological innovation and developments as regards payments, cross-border payments, CBDC, all of those things. We do think it's more important to get it right than to be the first. And getting it right means that we not only look at the potential benefits of a C CBDC, but also the potential risks and, and also recognize the important trade-offs that have to be th thought through carefully. We have a responsibility both to the U.S. and to the world that any steps taken for a U.S. Cent uh, digital currency be taken safely. One thing I want to point out with that clip, if Jerome Powell or any of the global elite are wondering why we don't trust them, it's because when anyone asks you a question, you never look into the camera and just give an honest answer. You sit there and read it off the page. It's obviously prepared. That's one of the main reasons no one trusts you. Hint, hint, hint. Jay Powell, if you want people to trust you, do this. Just look right into the camera. Look us in the eye and give us an honest answer. Although this may achieve the objective of the central banks being able to get funny money into the real economy, it presents a bigger problem in the sense the IMF would be in control of everything. And I don't like the fact that the United States has the world reserve currency. I think there is a better alternative but let's think this through. At least right now, the United States is incentivized to help out the other countries in the global economy. Those other countries make our stuff. They buy our debt and they keep our interest rates low, allowing the American public to have a higher standard of living because we are able to consume more than we actually produce. So the U.S has that incentive structure in place where those incentives are aligned to a certain degree with other countries. What would the IMF's incentive be to make sure that the global economy was functioning properly or to its maximum capacity? There isn't any incentive. In fact, we need to understand that individuals that work at the IMF that are in control, they're not even elected by the citizens of the individual countries. They're elected by the bureaucrats and the central planners themselves. Oh, but wait, there is more. When you look at the fine print, you see that there's a lot more to this Bretton Woods 2.0 than just these three objectives, central bank digital currency and the IMF giving the central banks reserves in the form of SDRs so this system runs more smoothly. There are no certainties, but I think there's a probability that the Bretton Woods 2.0 is more about total control of the entire global economy. Let's go right back to the IMF's own website and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. A number of analysts have suggested that any ambitious reform of the SDR should also embrace the private use of this global currency. Right now, you can't buy groceries at the grocery store with SDRs, but they're saying that they want that to be a reality in the future. This could include using SDRs to denominate private or government bonds or as a unit of account in commercial transactions, for example, in commodity pricing. A virtual SDR could facilitate the SDR's use in private transactions, creating a global cryptocurrency. And I think this next part is extremely important. This would certainly be preferable to existing crypto assets, all of which have experienced highly volatile prices. They're taking dead aim at Bitcoin and they want the SDR or a crypto digital version of the SDR to be the global currency that they control. And if you control the money, you also control the people. Step number two, why the IMF's Bretton Woods 2.0 plan for simply more cowbell just won't work. And it's actually very simple. If we look at the financial economy, 
and the real economy. On this side, the IMF wants to insert themselves right at the top. They want to control everything. Below them, the central banks like the Fed, the government, primary dealer banks, and the stock market. But on the other side, we have the real economy. And they're in charge of producing all the goods and services, all the stuff we use on a daily basis. But let's think this through. How does a society become richer? By just simply creating more currency units, more regulation, more micromanagement? Or does the society become richer simply by creating more stuff more efficiently at cheaper prices over time? If we think of an extreme, it really illustrates this point well. If we're on a deserted island and the only thing we have is a stack of money, let's say we've got a billion dollars, but the only thing around us is sand, a couple coconuts, and maybe some salt water, how rich are you? You're dirt poor, you don't have anything because this pile of a billion dollars won't buy anything because there's no stuff. You see, the production side of the equation has to come first. As long as you're producing goods and services, like this guy in a very simple economy, cows, corn, cotton, it allows the rest of the members of society to go out and produce other things because these individuals don't need to produce the items for themselves. So they can go out and become engineers, doctors, nurses, teachers, and society as a whole gets richer. We don't need more tops-down micromanagement, financialization of the economy, money printing, and artificially low interest rates. We need the individuals, just like you and I, to go out there and create more goods and services. That's how we improve the standard of living for society at large. But as you would imagine, the IMF has a different view. To understand that better, ugh, let's go right back to their website. Prudent macroeconomic policies and strong institutions are critical for growth, jobs, and improved living standards. Basically what they're saying is you plebeians in the real economy are just too stupid and ignorant to create more goods and services and economic productivity on your own. So you need the guidance of all of these central planners at the IMF. So their solution is just more cowbell, like I've been saying. In other words, more central planning, more money printing, which over the long run always creates inflation. It devalues the currency. Editor, throw up a chart of the dollar going back to 1913 when the Fed was started, and everyone at home can see it's lost 95% plus of its purchasing power. They also come in and want to stimulate the economy by creating all this excessive debt by lowering interest rates, so they're artificially low. But we know the only thing that does is create asset bubbles. It forces these productive individuals to go further and further out the risk curve. It turns them into gamblers because now they can't keep their money at the local community bank anymore and just park it in a savings account. So by the way, that money could be distributed better in the economy more efficiently to do what? Create more goods and services. They can't do that anymore because they're going to lose purchasing power to inflation because the central bank and the central planners are debasing that currency over time intentionally ironically enough. So then they have to go and take their net worth, put it into the stock market, put it into WeWork, put it into Tesla. They have to do whatever they can to just maintain their purchasing power, let alone to actually increase it over time. So what ends up happening is the real economy gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and the financial economy grows and grows and grows. But let's talk about some solutions. If the cowbell doesn't work, what can we do? It's very simple. We always tend to overthink this. All we need is consistent rule of law. That's it. That's the first thing. 
And I know this because I've traveled the world. I've been to over 40 countries and I've been in countries where you don't really have to worry about things changing overnight. I've also been in countries like Ecuador where the rules change almost hourly. You never know what the new rule is going to be. You go from communism to capitalism to socialism to communism to Marxism to cap. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. It's absolutely crazy. And that's why there's very little investment in the local economy. It's just like playing a baseball game and every single night there's different rules. The umpire just decides it will whether there's going to be one strike and you're out or 10 strikes and you're out. Who knows? You could never play the game. And it's the exact same way with the economy. That's why I always say the best thing that politicians could do when they're elected is take four years off and then quit. Just go straight to the golf course. Never go in the office. Don't do anything. We've got something that works pretty darn well. It's called the Constitution. We don't need you coming in making all these additional rules just to buy votes and pander to your constituents. And the other thing you need, along with consistent rule of law, is sound money. You don't want it always losing value. You want it staying the same, if not increasing in value. And that's why Bitcoin and gold are so important. But if you had these two components, you would have more investment, which means more stuff being created. The more stuff that's created, the more jobs you create, that's what creates the demand for the stuff. And then you have this positive feedback loop going up and up and up, taking society to the next level. It's the complete opposite of a doom vortex feedback loop you get with more and more IMF, Cowbell, World Economic Forum, and Bretton Woods 2.0. Step number three, the end game warning. This may be the simplest step I have ever gone over in one of my videos, but it's definitely the most important. There's an inverse relationship between centralized power and the ethics, morals, and character of the individuals who seek that power. So as centralized power increases, the ethics, morals, and character of the individuals who seek the power decrease. And this makes sense because if you think about what it takes to be a good politician or win an election, you have to be a fantastic liar. You have to have no values or principles whatsoever. You have to be willing to say whatever is required to get the vote. You have to be incredibly greedy and have an insatiable lust for power. And we can see that clearly with today's politicians, the individuals at the IMF and the World Economic Forum. If centralized power is very low, you're most likely going to get one of these people that's vying for the position and eventually will be in charge. If centralized power is incredibly high, you're most likely going to get this guy calling the shots sooner or later. So whether it's Bretton Woods 2.0, a great reset, or the lockdowns for the Cervasis sickness, you need to realize that it's increasing centralized power, therefore also increasing the probability we get the next Mussolini, Mao, or Joseph Stalin. It's time for us all to be rebel capitalists to fight these Marxist agendas and to stand up for free market capitalism and personal liberty. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here and I will see you on the next video.